Welcome to Waterford, Pennsylvania, located 15 miles south of the hustling and bustling city of Erie and adjacent to the beautiful shores of Lake LaBeouf, this town is filled with rich history and local pride. Join us as residents show and tell everything that makes their community a great hometown. Hi, I'm Dory Proctor, and I'm going to tell you about the Eagle Hotel and its history and a few little anecdotes about it, too. The history was built in 1826 of stone, which was unusual, and uh, the, the um, stone was quarried around Waterford. There's a couple of different stone quarries around Waterford, and uh, so Thomas King had, he had another hotel on, on Walnut Street, and it burned, so he built the Eagle Hotel. And there were several, several people have uh, purchased it through the years. Uh, there was Amos Judson and, and Pierpont Judson, and uh, Pier, Pierpont rent, uh, sold it to his nephew, Stanley Craker, and that was in 1922, and he uh, ran the hotel for 45 years, and then he turned it over to his nephew, Carl Geyer, and uh, he he did it up until 1973, and then he put it up for sale, and two gentlemen from Erie purchased it, but they only lasted a couple years. So in 1977, the Historical Society purchased it and uh, started a good uh, process of re rehabilitating the whole thing and bringing it back to where it was in the beginning. Well, originally it was a um, stagecoach co stop, and they also um, had room, a room up there where a traveling dentist would have an office, and uh, they off advertised for commercial men because they wanted you know, businessmen coming in. And they, they would always have the better rooms upstairs, but there were drovers that would come in at, you know, with their animals, and so they'd put their horses in the uh, there was another section, a livery section that was on the back. And, uh, and then later on they be, it became a dance hall because the uh, third floor has a spring floor which would give when the people were dancing, which is quite unusual. Well, it was purchased by the uh, Historical Society in 1977 and they uh, had a restoration project to put the hotel back like it was way back in the beginning. And uh, so they've worked really hard on that. And then after a few years, they decided to uh, rent out the first floor for a restaurant. And uh, they had several people have rent rented the restaurant over the years, but the one that's here now, he's been here for quite a while. That's at Troyer, and in, in they go by uh, sugar and spice. Well, Waterford has something that a lot of t communities don't have. And we, we can say that George Washington slept here because he came here in 1753. He slept on a, in a, there was a hill outside of town that he stayed in. Well, he delivered the message to the commandant of the fort. And uh, of course, to tell, he had to tell the fort that uh, the British were claiming this territory and they were supposed to leave, and, but they wouldn't do it. So his, his trip was in vain, but you know, he was only 21 at that time and he, was, he came in a British uniform and now we have a, a park next to the Eagle Hotel. It's a George Washington Memorial Park with the statue in it. But the statue originally was set up on in the main street between the Eagle Hotel and the Judson House. And uh, it, it, we had the largest crowd ever Waterford ever had for that. And uh, it's a, it, was, it was quite interesting, although I wasn't there. But <laughs> um, then, a few years later, they had to put a, f a fence around him. Oh, then in 1922, um, the historic, uh, Pennsylvania Historical Society and um, the Ma Masonic Order from Erie, and plus a lot of com uh, organizations in Waterford, decided to um, move it 
because it was a traffic hazard. So it was moved over behind the first street, behind where there was a, where the old fort was. There's a, but he was clear back. They put him clear back off the road. It was too far back. So then in this, in uh, later on, they brought him to up towards the street a little closer. My name is Nancy Alcorn Briggs, and I was born in this area, raised on a farm about four miles south of here, a dairy farm, and moved here to the William Judson house uh, at 104 Walnut Street. And today, I just uh, will talk about a bit about the Underground Railroad that passed along the creek below the house, how they entered the house, because William Judson was indeed an agent of the Underground Railroad. The house is really um, now about 8,000 square feet, the house alone without the property. Um, it has a number of fireplaces in each bedroom, um, three kitchens, the servants' quarters, which uh, originally was in the basement and is in fact where the people came in uh, that were fleeing the, the slaves and were there for food and hopefully a rest before they moved out of there then the next day. Um, it's large, it has a, it has a cold room with a, a, a nine inch thick door where ice actually was cut from the lake in Fort LaBeouf down at Porter Park, brought up by teams of horses and uh, stored in a little, uh, we call it the ice house, out at the, at the back end of the property, and brought into this room uh, and kept there to keep, you know, foodstuffs cold. Uh, the Underground Railroad really uh, followed, historically, the, the, the slaves were coming from the Venango area along the creek on the south side of the house down over a hill. And they watched for signs in various houses that uh, were welcoming to them and probably discovered a candle burning in the very top of the four-story house in what we call a sleepy eye window, which is half of a round window. And they would come across the lots down below, come over the hill, cross the road, and then into what then was the original cooking kitchen of the house where the, the cook cooked and, and slept, actually. Well, I, t I just think that William Judson was a brave soul because as an agent, um, he really had to be very cautious. In the attic, uh, we discovered a publication called The African Repository with his signature in ink and um, then other copies of it. And it's a publication that uh, clearly was about the African Americans. And he has been noted in two different books that I think you fi you'll find in Blasco Library, uh, indicating that he was indeed an agent. Hi, I'm Jim Edwards, and I'd like to talk to you about uh, the history of Waterford in the museum that we have here. Uh, I'm uh, currently the vice president of the Port Lebeuf Historical Society, and I would uh, invite you sometime to come down and visit us uh, because we made amazing changes down here in the, in, 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 in the museum. And the museum is located at 1997 and First Alley in Waterford. And it's directly across the street from the George Washington statue. Uh, so, but uh, we've done so many things in here since we took custody of it that if you had been here before, you would not recognize the place. This building uh, was built in 1970 by the Pennsylvania uh, Historical and Museum Commission. Uh, it was run by one of the local universities until the state decided to shut it down. But then uh, we made an attempt through our legislature and so forth to get custody of the properties, which include the museum, uh, Washington Park across the street where the statue is, and Amos Judson's house, which is right next door. 
and we finally did succeed in, in acquiring these. And uh, I've been working on it ever since. And as we have, many of our members have, and a lot of different outside groups have come in and helped. And, and there are so many that I, I just can't remember all of them. You know, it's great. From the high school kids that came down to work out back, uh, French Creek Living History, uh, so many people. Uh, I just can't name, name them all right now, but I do appreciate everything that's been done to help. Uh, what it is to, now we have this, we do have things here. It's not just a museum. Uh, we rent r this room out that I'm in now presently sitting for small groups such as parties or meetings or such. We have uh, French Creek Archaeological Society meets here sometimes. Uh, the Lions Club has met here. We had a French Christmas here uh, back in uh, late November. Uh, French Creek uh, Living History will be having a meeting here this 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 um, this month, so it, it's not just an open and closed museum. It's to be used by the people. Now, if you do come in to the museum, you'll see uh, the entrance way where uh, you will see a diorama of the 1753 fort. You will look up and see a picture of George Washington addressing the French commander. What is really neat, though, if you look next to the picture of the French commander, you will see a letter written in French. Now, this is an exact copy of the exact letter that Saint-Pierre, who was the commander here, sent back to Governor Dinwiddie in 1753. Just finished up a section that looks like part of the fort as you walk into the museum. So when you start your tour, you just go through the fort wall, and then you, we have Native American section, we have a... Uh, French section. It, it, it's very interesting trying to keep it all separated but yet combined so that you, you're walking a fine line. You have the Native Americans, you have the French period, you have the English period, and then later on uh, you have the uh, American period after a Red War when Waterford was laid out and also Waterford uh, and, and, and Erie. Well, I, I think sometimes we forget our history and I think that it is really interesting to come and see the beginning of your community. And this has started uh, 264 years ago when the French first arrived. So I think that it's not only English, but it's French, and plus that we have uh, Native American people who come in here also. And I think it, it, it's to reach those groups that, uh, and teach the kids. We have uh, school kids that come in here. Uh, we have uh, the senior class from Waterford comes in. They're very interested most every year. Mr. Sean Humphreys, who's a history teacher up there, brings them in, and he loves to come in here. Uh, but it's important to learn your history, you know. So hopefully we will be able to do this. So far we have had a very positive response from everybody. Hello, my name is Beverly Baylog. I'm the regent for the Fort LaBeouf chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, the Daughters of the American Revolution uh, started in 1890 um, nationally. Their headquarters is located in Washington, D.C. They have a huge building there that's absolutely gorgeous, and it um, covers one city block. It's very close to the White House. If you ever get to Washington, D.C., please be sure to stop in. Our local Waterford chapter began September 1st, 1925. And um, within the first nine years, um, the women of the organization um, purchased a boulder that they put in the Waterford Park um, with um, Revolutionary War patriots that lived and fought in Waterford, Pennsylvania uh, to memorialize them. Uh, they put a plaque on the rock. There are 15 soldiers named there, 11 of which are buried in the Waterford Cemetery and the rest in cemeteries close to Waterford. Um, our chapter regent, um, charter regent, is also buried in the Waterford Cemetery, as are several of the other, several other regions of the, our chapter. Our organization has um, there are meetings held at the Eagle Hotel. Uh, we actually have a room um, upstairs on the third floor of the Eagle Hotel that we keep all our memorabilia, our flags, um, pictures, books, um, 
we store them there. They were stored here in the Jetson House for a number of years, but um, when they renovated here, they were moved to the Eagle Hotel. Uh, the daughters of the Fort LaBeouf chapter also purchased property uh, that is now located um, behind the Topps Grocery Store. It is a 100 by 100 square um, piece of property, um, which is almost two acres up there behind. At, at one time, um, there was a huge hemlock tree that um, George Washington climbed and looked down upon, on, upon the fort, Fort LaBeouf, uh, before he went in to talk about um, the French leaving the area. <laughs> So um, the DAR purchased that property. Unfortunately, the tree, um, which was about 100 years old at the time he was here, got hit by lightning in around 1989, and um, the top came off. And right now, there's just kind of a stump up there, a big stump, but it's huge. I mean, it's huge. Um, so, but we still own the property. We purchased it in um, April 16th of 1934. So that's 86 years we have owned the property and what's left of the tree up there. My name is Harry Latta. I'm a captain of the Stancliffe Hose Company in Waterford and I'm here today to talk about the history of the fire department and how we came to be. If you look back in history, uh, and Waterford does have a, a significant history, um, we'd have to go back to 1759. Uh, and uh, that's when we had, um, at the time, George Washington uh, before the uh, revolution and was sent here and the French occupied this area of Fort LaBeouf. Um, the British came in, uh, they wanted to take over the land and have uh, access and waterways and set up forted, forts throughout the area. And the French didn't like that idea and uh, they actually burnt the fort down. So that is the first recordable fire uh, in our town and the first fire was arson. The uh, fire department, uh, as it's known today, uh, present day, is the Stancliffe Hose Company. Back uh, when our town was being developed and uh, pioneered, uh, a group of townspeople uh, knew the priority of fire protection uh, for the, the area. At that time, uh, in 1828, a group of those individuals, predominant citizens, uh, formed a committee and uh, actually started the organization of a fire service um, brigade within the borough and uh, later uh, moved through uh, the town and people joined and later became the Eagle Hose Company. The town actually fought fires uh, in the early ages of uh, the development with uh, buckets and that would be, as many people would understand, Bucket Brigade. Um, the structures were wooden, they weren't as they are predominantly now, uh, made of stone and metal and such, and uh, fireproof materials. So when there was a fire, um, the bell would ring um, at the firehouse. Uh, townspeople would come out and look to see where the fire was at. They would grab their buckets and form a line. And that line generally ran from either French Creek, uh, which is close by, or from cisterns uh, throughout town, and a cistern is a, a water container built in the ground and usually held 300 gallons of water and dumped the water onto the fire. In 1848, uh, the Waterford uh, Council uh, actually purchased a hand pumper, uh, a button hand pumper, that actually was manufactured in Waterford, New York. Uh, it was purchased in uh, the city of Erie by Renfis Reed, and uh, that was used by the city of Erie for a number of years before Waterford bought that hand pumper. The hand pumper was uh, taken and delivered to Waterford on a flat uh, train rail uh, from the city and brought into the borough and that pumper uh, was used to put out fires, still needing the hand brigade, but uh, it was most generally a, a better way of getting the water onto the fire. On March 3rd uh, of 1895, uh, 
we remember that date as the Great Waterford Fire. And uh, many communities and cities, of course, uh, relate to those, just like the Chicago Fire or the San Francisco Fire and everything like that. But Waterford at the time, uh, very small, uh, very proud, and the downtown district was a business district as well as residential. On that date, um, the whole west side of the town burnt and burnt down. Um, there were 17 businesses lost in that fire, but no lives were lost. In the months uh, after that fire, uh, the town council uh, actually adopted a uh, ordinance that any future buildings in the borough of Waterford would be made of brick. So as you see the town today, that's why we have so many brick buildings because we had brick foundries and forges in the borough and the surrounding areas to build these houses. In 1925, um, you remember I was talking about the hand pumper and that was a, a piece of equipment that was pulled by the firemen to and from fires. Uh, unlike today, we have motorized apparatus uh, that actually gets us to the fire and used for firefighting. Um, in 1925, um, uh, Aiden uh, Stancliffe actually donated a, a touring car, a white touring car, to be used as the first motorized fire uh, piece of apparatus for the borough of Waterford. So with that donation uh, from uh, Aiden Stancliffe, of course, came uh, the discussion of maybe recognizing him for that accomplishment of production for the borough. And uh, so after a few meetings, it probably came to be that we're going to call this new company the Stancliffe Hose Company in honor of uh, Jack Stancliffe. And uh, that's where we are today. And uh, we have uh, approximately 28 firefighters, all volunteer in our community. And we protect uh, not only our town of Waterford, uh, the township, and surrounding communities within Erie County. Hi, I'm Yvonne Boyle, and I'd like to talk to you about the salt trade in Waterford. Salt mines were found around Onondaga, New York, up in Salina, or Salina, New York, and they were loaded on ships and brought to Lake Erie, and they were loaded uh, in Lake Erie on ships that came to Presque Isle, and then wagons with oxen had the barrels of salt loaded on the wagons and it's 14 miles from Erie to Waterford and it would take two days maybe more because the road was so rough and muddy and they'd get stuck and have to go back but eventually it would come to Waterford and since Waterford was the best way to travel and fastest way to travel by water, they would unload the salt barrels in the salt warehouses that were by LaBeouf Creek, just outside of Waterford. And when the water was high enough, they would have these huge flat boats, many built in Waterford, 15 feet wide by 75 feet long, load the salt barrels on the flat boats and pull them down LaBeouf Creek into French Creek, into the Allegheny River, into Pittsburgh. Many times um, they would unload the salt and then reload coal from the Pittsburgh area and continue with the flatboats into the Ohio and down to the southern states. They would sell the coal and then they would chop up the flatboats and sell the timber and then head back. One of the big uh, ship captains on Lake Erie was Daniel Dobbins, which a lot of us are familiar with from the War of 1812. But before he got involved with the war and uh, Perry, he was a big salt trade shipper. And many people from Waterford, they said, made money because there would be up to a hundred 
oxen and people going back and forth from Erie to Waterford with the salt trade. And for example, a famous one was Judge John Vincent, a very early settler of Waterford. And they said in a Vincent journal that he had enough money in his later years that when his grandchildren came, a famous one, the Civil War hero, Strong Vincent, and they would sit at Christmas, they'd look under their dinner plates and he'd have a hundred dollar bill for all the grandchildren. So that was one person, uh, John Lytle, who was the originator of the Waterford Turnpike, obviously made money from the tolls, was another person. Um, a lot of uh, oxen, horses, slaves, food, clothing, business, uh, soldiers, were paid with salt because money was so rare in the paper or coin form. The salt trade ended because there were salt mines discovered in West Virginia, closer to Pittsburgh, uh, driving the cost to go so down that it wasn't feasible to continue it. So it ended after only of about seven years. My name is Father Norm, and I'm from St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Waterford. And I'm here to um, talk about the history of our church and its connection to this community. Okay, St. Peter's Episcopal began as an organized mission in 1827. There was a meeting at the Waterford Academy, which was the school that used to stand next to where the church is presently. And some members of the community uh, met there for the first service. Um, they met in the school until 1831, at which time it was decided that they would go forward the, with the building of a church. They were gonna do this with the help of the Congregation of Christ Church in Meadville. They had connections with the people down there, and those folks, as a mission, were going to help build this church in Waterford. So they donated money and property that was sold to buy the property here and the materials to uh, get the project going, along with the money that was raised by the people here in the community themselves. Well, I'd, I'd like to put the history in perspective because we're talking about a time that was just a little over 50 years from the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The president at the time was John Quincy Adams, who was the sixth president, son of the second president. Uh, so it, it's at the beginnings of this country, uh, some of the members of our congregation, the, the first congregation, would have probably some of the older ones would have remembered living as colonists of uh, England, and uh, they would have belonged uh, maybe to the Church of England, which became the Episcopal Church in America. So um, that's important to note. It, and, and what I wanted to add was um, after the church was built, um, at that time, our diocese was part of the Diocese of Pennsylvania. It wasn't separated off into separate dioceses. The whole state was one diocese. And it, it was uh, taken care of by Bishop White, who was one of the original bishops of the Episcopal Church. He at the time was 84 years old, talking about a man who entertained Washington in his home. Uh, he wasn't going to make the trip to Waterford to do a consecration on this new tr this new church, so he he talked to his assistant, uh, a uh, Bishop Henry Onderdonk, and uh, he was about 48 at the time, and he told Henry, um, "I've got this church for you up in northwestern Pennsylvania, and I'd like you to go up there and do a consecration." Now remember, this is 1832. So uh, a trip that today would take six or seven hours would have taken that many days back then. Well, we don't know how Henry got here. It 
It could have been by horse, could have been maybe partially by boat, maybe stagecoach. Um, but we know he didn't take a train because the trains didn't run at that time. There was one line out of Philadelphia to Germantown, but nothing going west. In fact, in 1832, now Andrew Jackson is president. He's the first president who ever uh, actually rode on a, a train. So. Um, it must have been quite a trip in early November making it across the mountains to get up here to do the consecration. But we know that he made it because we have this certificate of consecration that he signed and, and it's sealed, dated November 15, 1832. I wanted to mention that St. Peter's is the oldest stone, brick, or mason Episcopal church west of the Allegheny Mountains. So we're talking about an area that is from here to the Pacific Ocean. That's, that's pretty significant. And it's significant also um, in that St. Peter's is the oldest church building in Erie County. We're not the oldest congregation. Uh, I, I believe the Presbyterian Church is the oldest one in town here. But as far as the building, it's the oldest church building. St. Peter's belongs to the local Waterford Ministerium. And that group um, meets uh, kind of infrequently, but uh, we have different uh, activities that we're involved in. Presently, we'll be having Lenten soup suppers on Wednesday. Um, we have a fund whereby we uh, help people in need and uh, transients who come by way of us and um, we sponsor a, a release program for the children in the elementary schools um, for religious education and uh, basically uh, try to support the needs of the people here in Waterford, their spiritual needs. My name is Sharon Mitchell, and I'm talking to you today about our community involvement. We moved to Waterford when I was nine years old, and my parents bought a home right on the park, so it was a wonderful place to grow up. And the old gazebo, the original one, was still in the park at that time. Um, it was built in uh, 1876 and torn down, I believe, around 1956 or 57. I was kind of sad when that was torn down because I loved it. It was part of, of my heritage. Um, we started the Fort LaBeouf Historical Society in 1973 because we desperately wanted to buy the Eagle Hotel when it went up for sale. But we weren't able to raise enough cash, so we did start the Historical Society and decided to get some things done. And the first year in 73, that summer, we went out and painted the covered bridge, which had been neglected for a lot of years. Uh, parents painted and kids played in the road. We had one gentleman who had just had brain surgery and he started out painting, sitting in a chair. And about a week later, he was standing. And a few weeks after that, he actually climbed a small step ladder. So that just showed how determined he was to be a volunteer. Uh, I was on the Bi Erie County Bicentennial Commission and I thought, you know what, if I can do that for Erie County, I can do it for Waterford. So I thought, let's see if we can build a new bandstand. And Jean Stahl uh, drew the plans for us, and she took them off the original bandstand, but it was way too elegant, way above our financial and our expertise to build. So we had to modify it, but we had about six local contractors um, being in charge of it, and dozens of Waterford area people came out usually on Saturdays, to build. We started in April, went through May, June, and July, but we got it finished just before the first Waterford Heritage Days, which was really nice. We added the cupola the next year. We built it in my basement, actually, because it was winter time, and we had to build it in two pieces to be able to get it out of the basement. And when we put it on the top, we had to choose a very skinny person to be inside, to hold the two sides together, and then he had to crawl out of a hole for a shutter so we, he could get out and we'd put the last shutter in. So that was, um, that was quite an experience and involved dozens, maybe hundreds of people all the way through. I don't know how long ago, but the gazebo was rebuilt about three years ago, 
it was torn down completely because they felt it should be handicapped accessible. So they rebuilt it and the design is different this time around than it was the first two times we rebuilt it. Community involvement is very important because what makes a small town run, there are a lot of things that a council can't do on their own. They have to have volunteers in whatever it may be. Um, and the community is very active in participating in whatever's asked of them. I, the merchants and the citizens. Hi, my name is Becky Dwyer and I live in Waterford and I'm here today to talk about the tradition of painting the water tower. Do you remember the old water tower? It was located down the hill from the high school on the corner of 7th and Cherry. It was a huge structure, a water tank for the community set high on tall, tall legs. The legs were very narrow and there were angled rungs on the way up and partway up was a barricade made out of barbed wire, probably to keep the casual climber off the water tower, but that didn't stop any of us. At the beginning of every year, the seniors followed the tradition of painting the water tower. It was just something that we all did. Every class seemed to do. You'd climb the water tower and paint something on it. Uh, congratulations, class of fill in the blank, whatever your class was, uh, super seniors, uh, go bison, uh, and all of our names. We've pretty much autographed the, the water tower with our names. Well, a little bit of planning went into painting the water tower beforehand. You kind of had to scope out the situation and uh, kind of had to have a plan of attack because the barbed wire really did present a barricade and then rungs were excuse me, the rungs were really very narrow and angled and kind of difficult to climb. So we kind of scoped that out in the daytime. Uh, a group of us decided that we were gonna embark on painting the water tower. We collected paint cans and flashlights and just sort of waited for the right sort of day to come up. Um, we knew we had to do it in the dark. We knew we had to be quiet, but we didn't want the water tower to be wet. We didn't want it to be too cold. We wanted the perfect condition. So after, after kind of a surveillance mission, we were just waiting for the right night to come around. If I'm remembering the night that we went up on the water tower, we wrote Super Seniors and we wrote our class year up there. And I think Go Bison was off in one corner and we signed the water tower with all of our names. There was a group of five or six of us who went up and each of our first names were up on the water tower. Every class kind of does something different. Um, some classes have mentioned teachers that they've liked and a teacher's name might find its way up the water tower. I know that there was a class that managed to get a wheelbarrow up there. How they accomplished that, I'll never know. Um, another class had a stop sign pulled up and brought up and posted on the water tower, a real live stop sign. I don't know how they did it. We, we weren't quite that inventive. The water tower has disappeared. Probably they got sick of everybody painting it. It's been replaced, it's been moved, it's been relocated up the hill. The structure is completely different. It's unclimbable now um, and it's not there anymore. We really looked at this as carrying on a tradition. Probably some folks thought of it as a prank, um, that it may have been destructive in some way, but we really thought of it more as a rite of passage and continuing a community tradition. Every senior class wanted to make sure the water tower got painted. My name is Kathy Williams and I'm going to talk to you about Waterford Days. Waterford Days was organized in 1974 um, because a group of local citizens wanted to save the Eagle Hotel which was slated for demolition. Waterford Days takes place the third weekend in July and is the largest fundraiser for our local nonprofits and school booster groups. We have uh, handmade craft vendors in the gazebo park, about a hundred of them. Um, and along the south 
edge of the park, we have food vendors, and all the food vendors are Fort LaBeouf School District area nonprofits and booster groups. Uh, across the street in the ballpark, we have reenactors who actually camp overnight for the entire weekend over there and give you a little bit of living history, um, how, how they lived and some of the crafts. We have artisans that come in, uh, blacksmiths and um, weavers and such. Uh, flint napping is another one of the crafts that they do over there um, that you can go and look. Uh, some of them just display things and some actually uh, allow you to purchase their items. Um, on Saturday morning, we have a parade at 10 o'clock that steps off at the high school and goes down Cherry Street. Um, by 11 o'clock, that's over. We have free entertainment all weekend long. We bring local bands in, and we've actually uh, had people from out of town come in, but bands. And uh, we have events going on all over the community. The local churches get involved with bake sales and rummage sales. Uh, the American Legion does a dinner. Uh, the churches usually do luncheons and, and sales, and art sales, and that kind of thing. Um, we have stuff going on at the Fort LaBeouf Historical Campus, which includes the Judson House, the Eagle Hotel, and the Fort LaBeouf Museum, as well as Washington Park. Um, and there's a lot of stuff going on there with uh, inside the Judson House. We have uh, quilters uh, that people can come and see the displays. Outside, we have a car show. Um, down at the museum, of course, they have medical displays and they have uh, sometimes reenactors that are set up outside there. Um, and there's tours throughout the entire campus. Waterford Days includes the entire community um, from rummage sales and bake sales at the churches, uh, yard sales among the residents of the town. Uh, the library does a book sale. Uh, we also have uh, things going on at the campus that drives foot traffic down Main Street on both sides across the front of each of the stores and helps the local businesses in that way. Waterford Days is a tradition that brings people home. Uh, people that have moved out of state come home, enjoy um, getting with fr friends and family at the park and usually stay for the entire week and actually have reunions um, while they're in town. So it really brings the people together and we're all about let's bring the community together and have a good time. Hi, I'm Susan Osborne. Today I'd like to talk to you about Lake LaBeouf. It's about 13,000 years ago that the lake was formed and uh, it was a Wisconsin glacier that broke off and a uh, piece of ice that broke off and formed the lake. They're called Kettle Lakes and there were uh, seven or eight of them, Lake Pleasant being the jewel of those lakes. I grew up in Waterford. Uh, my whole life have been here and we swam every day. Every day we'd ride our bikes and um, they, uh, uh, wouldn't allow our bikes in there, so we hung them on the uh, bridge, and then the older boys would would uh, push our bikes in the lake, and we'd had to go in there and, and retrieve them. We would collect um, pop bottles all over town to get money, and then spend it on pop candy and uh, bait, lures, and boat rental. We would go early morning. I would go in the water early morning. I had long red hair, long thick hair, and the smell, I can still smell the, um, the seaweed in the lake, and uh, I'd go home. My mother would have to drag, drag me home uh, at sunset. You know, we would just swim all day. And then I fished uh, with my younger brother. We fished every day, almost every day, and um, we would catch a great, great lake for panfish, uh, crappy sun, sunfish, perch, suckers. Uh, we did get some trout. We had fishing tournaments. Uh, Lake LaBeouf is the only place where the tiger muskie originated. Uh, it, it, all the fish that the Fish Commission uh, supplied all over were from Lake LaBeouf. They used to milk the muscalunge eggs and then take them to the Fish Commission and um, produce uh, fish for the commission to uh, stock other lakes. And um, so the, I saw these 37 pound uh, musky, tiger musky, 39 pound. Uh, they're, you know, three, four, five feet big. And um, just the thrill when I, when I um, sleep sometimes, I have rapid eye movement and I 
you know, some people fall in a hole or, or they, uh, they jump, but I set the hook, uh, the, the thrill of setting a hook and catching fish. Uh, so this, this uh, legend was, uh, Chet Seymour was the only person who actually hooked uh, old ma moss back, a tiger uh, muskie. And the, the legend is that, that it, the, the real, the, the fish would, would take the LeBuff creeper, this uh, wooden uh, imitation of a frog, and uh, they said $2,000 worth of those lures are in the lake, that these muskie, you couldn't be caught. Uh, they, they'd get on there, and then the, the reel, the, the line would go out and just burn your hand. Uh, uh, so he was fishing, and uh, apparently is the only person who survived to, um, to, to ever have hooked, hooked this fish. So there's a ballad that Jim Skiff wrote, and it says uh, eight, he was eight feet long, and uh, every inch was a fight. 80 pounds of mean, ordinary pike. Uh, the Frenchman couldn't catch him, and the English wouldn't try. But the Seneca, they say, that fish will never die. Hi, I'm Bonnie Milford, and I wanted to talk about Waterford one of my favorite memories is of Wayne Doolittle and the High Low Market, Doolittle High Low Market. Um, Wayne Doolittle is my mother's cousin by marriage. He and Martha were married almost 59 years and they have two children, Joyce and Jim, married to Nancy. Um, Wayne ran Doolittle's Market for, the, the market itself was in operation from 1946 to 1986, 40 years, right on the main street of Waterford, 208 High Street. Um, Wayne did most of, all of the meat handling. Um, his sausage recipe was in big demand. People would come in there and get it already produced and they are always asking for his secret recipe. Uh, Wayne uh, was born in Union City. Wilmina and Davis were his parents and he has a sister, Phyllis Russell, um, in Union City. He was born there and went to school there and came to Waterford and graduated from the Waterford Academy and was 1953, I think, and in 1950. In 1953, he was drafted into the Army. He and Martha were also married that year, and they um, fulfilled that military obligation while still having a connection with the store. His father, Davis Doolittle, actually started the store in 1946. Wayne became a partner in 1961. And then when his father retired in 1970, Wayne became sole owner. And they also took over the Five and Dime next door. So Martha ran that and Wayne ran Doolittle's Market and mostly did the meat preparation. Wayne wanted to include every one of his employees. He had many long-term employees. He kept the community of Waterford financially stable by employing all these people, and he just loved each and every one of them. He wanted to mention them all by name, but that was not possible. But he, um, he did keep a lot of people in Waterford busy. Hi, my name is Judy Nelson, and I would like to tell the story about my dad that was Mayor Earl Dawson. My family moved to Waterford in 1957 uh, as a result of a picnic that we attended down at Pooty's Point, which was a small picnic area on Lake LaBeouf. My mother worked with Mrs. Pooty, and we had a picnic, and my dad just loved the town and asked if there were any houses for sale. And the next day she came to work and said the house across the street from her was for sale. And we came out and we looked at it and we purchased it in 1956 and we moved in 1957. My dad was an employee of General Electric and worked second shift. 
And uh, several years after we moved to Waterford, they adopted an ordinance that was alternate parking. Well, when they adopted the ordinance, of course, with him working second shift, he had to move his car back and forth. Well, the one night he forgot and he got a ticket. He was so upset, he came back in the house and he said, I'm going to take and run for mayor. Well, he was a registered Republican all of his life, but the man who had held several terms of the mayor ha was a Republican also. So he pranced down to the Erie County Courthouse and changed his affiliation to be a Democrat, and he ran for mayor. It was, and then he won. It was the first Democratic mayor that the town of Waterford ever had. So he was excited about that, and he loved it. He, and he served four consecutive terms. At that point, he was 62 years old and decided that it would be best that possibly he was getting too old to hold that because he did have a hearing problem. And some of the things he would fill in with that really, because he didn't hear, were quite interesting. So he gave up the duties of mayor when he was 62. Uh, Dad was always involved with the community. He loved Waterford. He was a member of the Waterford Lions Club, which he served as the King Lion. And they also awarded him the Melvin Jones Award, uh, which was for distinguished service in the community. He was also involved with the Salvation Army. Uh, he was involved with a couple of the com uh, county projects. Uh, and committees that were in Erie, and he would get so mad at Lou Tulio because Lou Tulio got all the money for Erie and nothing for Waterford. But one of his major accomplishments as mayor was to get the park cleaned up. Uh, there was a lot of vegetation in it, and it all had to be approved, and I can remember going to Finley Lake to get a chemical that was fish-friendly, and uh, so they got the park cleaned up, and ironically, the park is in dismay now, and they are trying to form a committee to clean up Porter Park again. The, the nice thing about living in a small community, uh, many people come up to me on the street and say, I still remember your dad, what a wonderful man and how gentle he was. And the funny thing about it is that he talked to everybody, loved to talk to everybody. And he, if he said to you, hello, my friend, which he quite frequently did, that meant he forgot your name. My name is Brenda Williams, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the foundation of Waterford. I believe the churches are a large foundation of any community, and Waterford our little town of Waterford has a population of just over 1,500 people. And we have seven churches, so we have a good foundation here. We need to have God in our lives. And uh, so um, I just think that what's really important is that in this little community, most everybody attends one of these churches. Um, we have Asbury United Methodist, that's my church. And we have St. Peter's Episcopal. We have uh, First Presbyterian Church, Waterford Church of the Nazarene, Waterford Baptist Church, St. Mark Lutheran Church, and All Saints Roman Catholic Church. Um, these churches, everybody works together so well. We have so many fun activities that go on. What we all look forward to is in the spring, all the churches go together and we have Lenten soup suppers and one of the churches hosts all six weeks of every Wednesday night soup suppers. Uh, one church provides the ministry and music, another church provides the food for the evening. And I, I can't tell you, we're so looking forward to those events. Uh, then in the summer months, uh, we have a festival called Waterford Days, and we, all the churches go together on Sunday morning. We have our community, our community worship service in the park outside in Waterford and that's just a really beautiful occasion everybody looks forward to that as well uh, many of the churches have uh, a lot of uh, activities that all of us try to participate in um, 
Vacation Bible School, the Presbyterian Church and the Methodist Church combined. We didn't have enough children from each of those two organizations, so we combined them and everybody works together. Some provide the crafts and the music and the, you know, the different activities for the children and that's just so fun for everybody to get together. Um, we have a lot of, of course the churches are gathering places, social meeting places. Uh, two of the churches here in Waterford host the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous AA group. We have our uh, Girl Scouts that meet at the Methodist Church. Um, there's a fun activity that goes on over to the Baptist Church where they actually have, I believe it's like 10 teenagers that come once a week for crafts and Bible study. Um, it was called the Olympians. That was great fun. I, I just learned about that one. Uh, of course, any, any of the things that go on in Waterford, we have obviously deaths and, and so on. So we've all been in each other's churches for various weddings, funerals, those kind of things. But a lot of the, the best part that I think about with Waterford churches is how well we all work together. There's a Waterford Ministerium where they help people who are in need. Maybe someone's just passing through or maybe who, someone who lives in the community just needs a helping hand, a hand up, and so we can uh, offer to help that. What these churches working together is to be Jesus' hands and feet in our community and doing the work of the Lord here in Waterford, showing our Christian brotherhood to one another here and around the community and to newcomers who pass through. I, I really feel that all of the churches are very welcoming and kind. Of course, that's what we're all about is being Christian. And um, with this small community of only like 1,500 people with seven churches, it's obvious that this community is uh, faithful. My name is John Barava. I am here representing the Waterford Community Fair. I've been affiliated with the Waterford Community Fair for in excess of 25 years. Um, I was actually solicited to be the secretary of the fair 20 some years ago and somehow evolved into the president, which I am now. Um, the fair began in the park here in Waterford, just north of us a little bit. There's a park that's been there forever. Um, the fair did not have any land or buildings of their own, so they, everything was portable. And in 1937, the Waterford Community Fair Association, which is their legal name, was born. Uh, it's duly chartered in the state of Pennsylvania. I have a copy of the bylaws if you'd like to see them. Anyway, they started in the park. <clears throat> everything was portable. All the pens had to be built for the animals. Uh, the stage at the elementary school was the stage for the fair. Um, it really was um, a simpler time. Uh, it evolved in 1970. They kind of outgrew the park and they were fortunate to secure 52 acres south of town, here about a mile, and they commenced to build buildings and make a fairgrounds. In 1970, they acquired the 52 acres and built uh, two buildings. One was the home show building where they put vegetables, fruits, flowers, and the other one was the first dairy barn where they put animals. Interesting story is the directors at that point in time, when they went to the bank to borrow something like $12,000, it wasn't a whole lot of money by our standards, but they not only had each of the 15 directors sign the mortgage, but all of their wives. And I guess there was a lot of uh, uh, unhappy homes for a little while <laughs> till they paid off the mortgage. They now have, um, Today, there are now 13 buildings on that 72 acres. There's a fence around the whole thing, a um, couple fences. Uh, there's a more secured fence around the grandstand area. There's a horse arena that's 300 feet long. Um, so it's grown over that time. Yeah, there's approximately a range of 35 to 40,000 people that attend the six-day fair. The cost to get into the fair uh, for an adult is three dollars okay so if they just want to come for one day with mom and dad and two kids that are over 12 years old they're going to pay 
a grand total of $12 to get in the gate. Now that doesn't include rides or food or anything, so when they get in, they have to pay for that. Parking's free. Um, or another option, which has kind of been quite popular, is they can buy a button. It's good for the whole week. The button costs them $8, <coughs> but they can get in all six days if they just wear their button. Um, the money uh, goes to the fair um, to do things such as pay premiums. Those 6,000 entries I told you cost the fair somewhere between $25,000 and $30,000. So it costs a significant amount of money to run the fair. Um, so that money goes to recoup some of our expenses. Um, the ride carnival will cost us probably about $30,000. You know, I mean, there's an expense to running the fair. So we've been fortunate that uh, we have made a profit the last, um, about the last five years running that we have good and hard fast numbers on. Well, I think it's a venue that the community's proud of. Um, <clears throat> and we are serious about um, our role in enhancing that asset, you know. Um, we easily could, um, we wouldn't have to do this, we wouldn't have to work as hard as we do at it. Um, and not that, we don't have a lot of volunteers, but those 15 directors do a lot too. <laughs> um, so, I think it brings a, a pride to the community. Um, uh, we were working with the township supervisor one time, and he told me the question. He goes, "Well, why wouldn't we work together, John?" He goes, "You're probably the biggest entertain, biggest event of the year in the Waterford area." And I never thought about it that way. But when you have thirty-five to forty thousand people attending, there isn't much else that can compete with that. Heritage days in the park, you know. But but anyway, so. I think, I think the thing we're most proud of is that we're, uh, when we meet with the community, they're proud of what we're doing. We hear it all the time. They are happy about the asphalt we put down so they don't have to walk in mud anymore. They're happy about lighting, you know, because the lower end of the fairgrounds used to be dark and food vendors and everybody didn't want to go down there. Now they fight to go down there, you know. I mean, those are all, uh, they're growing pains, but, um, they're, they're good growing pains. And I think, the, I think the thing that we're most proud of is when the community comes back to us and said, you guys are doing a good job, you know, for us, for the community. Hi, I'm Mike Allgaier, and uh, I just wanted to share my experiences here uh, in Waterford and my connection to the people of Waterford. Uh, it turns out that uh, my ancestors have uh, been in this area for quite a long time. Uh, 1800s, uh, my great-great-grandfather settled uh, uh, less than eight miles from here. And, and uh, the uh, uh, situation was he moved there and uh, was a trained as a chair and furniture maker from Germany. Um, and so my family has uh, come from, from all of, all of the, uh, 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 from him and uh, we have multiple family members in the area. The other thing is in addition to my father's family is my mother's family, which is also, uh, it's almost less than two miles from where my father's uh, uh, relatives had started and uh, that is uh, also another history of uh, German descent as well. And, uh, and my third situation or in this is that I've uh, come to Waterford uh, in 1994 as the pharmacist of the uh, Waterford Pharmacy. It began as Waterford Apothecary and uh, that was in 1994. Uh, the pharmacy uh, goes back quite a long time. Uh, there's, uh, there have been many uh, owners and uh, operators of the pharmacy, but uh, as of uh, 1994, the uh, owner of the pharmacy at that time wanted to transition, uh, wanted to sell the business because of uh, further educational goals that she wanted. And uh, at the time, there were three pharmacies in Erie that had closed. And as a result, uh, in my pursuit of finding other opportunities, uh, 
pharmacist who had owned Orange Park Apothecary at the time, he ended up uh, getting nearly a simultaneous call asking if he was interested in buying a pharmacy at the time that I asked to have a position to continue. So that's how I ended up in Waterford and for four years we operated the pharmacy until 1998 and then, uh, uh, and then it was closed for a period of time and then December 8, 1998 we reopened the pharmacy and I've been here from 94 until now, it's nearly 23 years and uh, I've grown, you know, uh, again very uh, accustomed to the people who come uh, routinely and so on and I'm very appreciative of their, ser you know, their opportunity to honor to provide them their services. And I've also been able to deliver some medications to people. I've actually gone and I'm an immunizing pharmacist so I've gone to a few homes to immunize people who are unable to come to the pharmacy themselves and so that's that is very uh, uh, satisfying to be able to provide services like that. My mother had told me uh, uh, at one point when she was in the pharmacy that uh, there is a dance floor above the pharmacy and and she said when she was 16 she she danced up there um, her her maiden name was uh, Helen Bible and uh, so she's from the big uh, fi Bible family that is also uh, part of the the area as well and uh, so I would tell people as they come into the pharmacy that uh, uh, I was here before I was here you know in that sense that she was there before and had to, you know, get a lot of fun with that. My name is Paula Sherwood, and I'm going to tell you about the log cabin restaurant that my parents owned in uh, Waterford. The log cabin restaurant was actually a part of uh, a gas station in Waterford and it was moved from around the corner. It was attached to the gas station but it was moved around the corner to the uh, site where my parents operated it in, on uh, Route 97. And um, they had the restaurant from um, 1970 until 1991 and then my brothers operated the restaurant until 1998. They purchased the restaurant from Ed and Harriet Hopkins that lived here in Waterford. When the restaurant opened in 1970, um, my dad was a chief steward on board ship in the Merchant Marine, so he had experience with, with cooking, and um, he really felt that just a mashed potato and gravy kind of place was the kind of restaurant that he wanted to operate and so they opened the restaurant. They also had homemade pies of all different kinds and sorts that we um, were there for the customers purchase and um, it, the restaurant was like a meeting place in town. Everybody met there. Um, they came from far and wide and um, it just seemed like Waterford was so busy with traffic and everybody would stop at the restaurant. We had like truck drivers that would stop and loggers that were there and we had well drillers that would come in. It was just a, a down to earth kind of place that you could come in in your dirty boots and it didn't matter. My brothers and I, uh, Kirk and Dean, we kind of grew up in the restaurant so we got to do a lot of the work there also. But it was just kind of a family affair and um, we all worked together and um, we did a lot of catering we did weddings and we did funerals and we did receptions at the restaurant or receptions at another facility. We catered a lot of the um, stars that came into the Warner Theater into Erie and to the Civic Center. Um, we would take meals into their crew and uh, take things right to their, their buses when they came in. Our local customers were very important to us. You know, they're the ones that uh, came in and and brought their families on Sundays and, and brought their families during the week for, for our meals. Um, one of the things that my mom always said was that the restaurant was um, on the way to wherever you were going. Even though the restaurant has been closed now for almost 20 years, um, my brother and I still uh, on occasion meet people that have been there and they always bring up fond memories that they have of the restaurant meeting their families and and um, coming for the good food and and uh, the homemade pies.
My name is Debbie Humphreys and I'm a business teacher at Fort LaBeouf High School and I'm going to be talking about Pennsylvania Business Week at Fort LaBeouf High School. Um, Pennsylvania Business Week began at Fort LaBeouf High School in 1997 and it was the first of its kind in the nation, first educational economic program. The Pennsylvania Business Week began with um, the Manufacturer and Business Association and Art Bergamasco was principal at that time. In 1999, ACES, the Americans for Competitive Economic Systems, was then, um, it was handed off to them at that point. During Pennsylvania Business Week, students are divided into nine companies and across three industries, and they take a, they all start at a level playing field, and they take the business and hopefully turn it into something amazing and they are competing across four competitions. Uh, they have a RONA, or Return on Net Assets, competition that is done through a computer simulation. They have an advertising competition. They have a stockholders competition and a trade show competition. And there are winners um, in each of those categories. And then overall, there's a top company where the winner receives $100. The first one is the Return on Net Assets. Um, that's the most visible of the competitions and students compete to be on the Fortune, um, Fortune 900 board and they um, are looking to see how they do in relationship to the other companies. And um, they have to make decisions based on research and development, marketing, how are they setting their price, where are they going to advertise, how much are they going to put into research and development and they have to think those through throughout the week. They make 12 total decisions. The um, advertising competition, students create a 60 second commercial and then they have to, um, they have to develop a, how they are going to do their print campaign, where are they going to advertise, what television shows are they going to advertise on, and really hone in on who their target audience is. The stockholders competition is probably the most intense uh, because they have to discuss their financial decisions that they've made throughout the week and understand why they made those decisions. How did they react to um, their competition maybe lowering their prices? And it's really where we get the meat and potatoes of how they understand the competition. The final competition is the trade show competition where they are um, in the gymnasium and they compete for the customer to come to their table, um, present their sales pitch, show the product prototype, and hopefully close the deal with a sale. Each, each year the seniors look forward to this because it's a break from their traditional schedule. The whole school's rearranged, um, and not only do they get to work with all of these students, different students, um, they get to work with members of the community who serve as either business advisors or come in as speakers giving them career advice. Uh, while this program is an economic education program, I feel the students learn so much more than just some basic business skills. They have an opportunity to work with students that they normally wouldn't choose to work with. They get an opportunity to maybe recognize some strengths that students have that they wouldn't otherwise see. And by the end of the week, they are talking and communicating with students that are outside of their traditional circles. Uh, my name is Keith Gilson, and I'm here to talk about the success of the music program at Fort LaBeouf. Um, in, my, in my position as the music director of Fort LaBeouf, uh, the, that encompasses uh, doing the chorus, band, orchestra, jazz band, pep band. Uh, we've got great students involved in each one of those ensembles. Very proud of the success that they've achieved over the past few years. Uh, each year we strive to make the next better by improving on uh, what we have done in the past and reflecting back and, uh, and, and what makes it successful is how student driven it is and it's not just the students coming in and playing or, or singing it's developing a team or business where, where we talk about um, where do you fit in? We have a young lady who's got a passion for the life skills students, so she's 
always continuously working on where can we fit the life skills into our music programs. That's just for example. Uh, right now we're working on our musical and I have a young lady who's uh, got a passion for musicals and a passion for going, and she actually wants to go into uh, business, uh, music business administration. So she's our student director and she's just phenomenal. She, I sit back and watch what she's doing and she's running it and it's great. So the fact that there is this ownership into the program is what makes it successful. And, and going along with, with what the students are doing and, and the ownership and, and, and the system that we have uh, implemented in our music program, that is, that is uh, only successful because of the support we have from the community and from our administration our administration sees how important music is and how important arts are and have really helped helped us develop a, a successful program. We have a wonderful Performing Arts Center booster program um, where, where the, the boosters will come in and help us um, generate funds, help us run some of the programs we have, if, the, if it's the, the dinner theater, the marching band, the jazz band but they're, they're continuously helping, not just helping generate funds, but being plugged into the community and getting support from within the community. Because our students are becoming successful here at Fort LaBeouf, as an ensemble or as a, as a group or a team, okay, it enables them to, to go, go outside of the school in extracurricular, like, uh, like with the Junior Phil where we're very excited to have such a large amount of students involved in the Junior Phil. At one point this year, there was 12 students in, involved in the Junior Phil. Um, and it, that started with just one or two. But they went back to the school and the kids uh, saw what fun they were having and, and wanted to partake in that as well. So um, that has just snowballed. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a point of pride that that there's so many students from, from our school uh, here in Waterford that are in the Junior Phil or in our, our district festivals. We've had a lot of students go through what's called PMEA, is the uh, Pennsylvania Music Educator Association. Uh, for musicians, it's sort of like uh, with a football team that goes to states and it's our version of going to districts and then competing uh, for top chairs to move on to regions which our, our, our districts is, it goes uh, a little bit past uh, Warren and, and down by St. Mary's and our region is just above Pittsburgh on up. And once they do well at, their, at, at regions, they'll move on to states. And we were very blessed last year to have so many students um, in states. And we actually have a young man who's going beyond states and going into All Eastern, which is uh, top, he's a top oval player in, in the state, he was number one in the state actually. And now he's gonna be um, representing Fort LaBeouf at all Easterns, which is, I think it's about nine, nine to 11 states on the Eastern side here. So it's quite a, quite a great accomplishment. Hi, my name is Megan Richter, and today I would like to talk about B. Canfield. B. Canfield um, is a local figure, not only in Waterford, but she was very um, well known in Erie. She, um, I'll tell her story, but she eventually had a show on TV that made her well known. Um, she is really an extraordinary person for that day and time. She was um, only 16 years old when she left her family to become a nanny. Her mother died when she was very young and went to live with relatives, but it, at age 16 she um, needed to have a job. And that really became her um, stepping off point, that she had very many careers and very many opportunities and things that women today are still um, admiring. So she um, was a nanny and then she got married and that marriage ended in 1945 actually in a divorce which I find is interesting because you don't hear of that in those days and ages of people actually getting divorced. Um, but then she kind of picked up her life and eventually became a, a regional executive in a cosmetics um, firm, a cosmetics um, industry um, and 
just kept redefining herself as the situations in her life changed. Um, the house that I that is now where my business is located, she moved into in the 50s. She had gotten remarried and renovated that house and also became a store owner. She owned the Royal Lady Maternity Shop, which I think is a great name for a maternity shop. I, um, I think that kind of speaks to her spirit of that pregnant women should be treated like royalty. While B owned the maternity shop, uh, a television producer or an ad uh, advertising executive came up and said, we wanted to um, do some advertising for your store. And she responded to the person from WICU that there was no platform on their, on their TV station that would interest her patrons and that, there was, that they were not providing anything for her customers to watch. So shortly after, that executive came back to B and said, well, why don't you start your own show if you know what all these women want to hear and see? So she did. B Canfield's TV show started airing in the 60s, and up until the 80s, she was on air, started one day a week, grew up to five days a week. And I like to think of her as the Erie's version of Katie Couric, where she would promote um, things going on in the medical community. She gave blood on air to show people how important it was to support the community blood bank. She interviewed David Matthews, and she was a big supporter of the arts. And I believe she um, was in some of the shows at the Playhouse. Um, she, she liked the Second Harvest Food Bank. Um, again, any type of charity organization, she would give them a platform to discuss their issues or, you know, she gave them a space to talk. And um, I think that was good in that day and age and, um, you know, a little bit different. It was more female-centered. It was more family-centered. Um, it wasn't just the news. It was more community involvement and her reaching out to the community. Hi, I'm Heidi Longstreet, and I'm here to talk about the ghosts of Waterford. When I first joined the Historical Society and I was hearing all these reports of paranormal activity going on, I thought, wow, how can an entire town be haunted? So I started looking at the history of it. And of course, the Indians were here first. They lived here, they died here. Then the French came here and they built their fort. They lived here, they died here, they were buried here. Uh, when they left, they burnt their fort down. The British came in, they built their fort on top of the ruins of the French fort. They lived here, they died here. Then the Americans came in and they built their town on top of the ruins of all of this. And they even have their cemetery, their old cemetery, at the end of 2nd and West Street. It fell to ruin. And they took the headstones from there and they put that in the corner of the new cemetery on the other side of town. They dug up those bodies, and I had heard stories that they paved the streets with the bodies and the dirt from the old cemetery. So I found newspaper articles that talk about it. Whether or not it's true or not, I mean, there has to be some validity to it because it did make the papers. We know that the cemetery was dug up. It's where the borough garage is now. So I don't know if that could be also the cause of why there's so much activity in the town. All these graves that have been tore up and the town is literally built on top of it all. And I've talked to people who have said that their grandparents told them that they would find like pieces of bone and pieces of jewelry in the streets because they use that dirt from that old cemetery to fill in the potholes. It was dirt streets back then. So I don't know if you believe that, you know, that could be the cause of the activity or not. I don't know. But you know what else it could be is I kind of think that the people, the people that live here now have such a strong love for the town. Even maybe in death, they just don't want to leave. I think that's what it is, is they're just watching over the town. I was born and raised in Waterford, not really in the borough itself, but in the 
uh, township areas. Uh, I live in Green Township. I've uh, raised my family here, and it's just a good community to live in. I, I really wouldn't want to live anywhere else. My favorite thing about Waterford is obviously the Waterford Community Fair. Um, not that there aren't other uh, facets of Waterford that I like a lot, but uh, I guess I devote a lot of energy to the Waterford Community Fair, so I'm most proud and most uh, appreciative of that. Oh, I think definitely my favorite thing about Waterford is the uh, lake and um, the people that come and enjoy the lake and, and um, still use it, you know, these days. I love Waterford. Um, I never thought I'd come back here, of course, but uh, uh, we, we would, uh, I, I just think the lake is a treasure and um, I love being here. Raise my kids, uh, I have some, we kayak, uh, we, we still fish down here. And um, I grew up most of my life in Waterford. I did spend some time in Erie, but mm -hmm. uh, started out in Waterford and I'm living in Waterford now. I love mm -hmm. Waterford, my church is here. What I like about Waterford is the history. I love Waterford because of the history it has here, because George Washington was here. I guess the fact that I can um, walk up the hill and actually see a tree that he climbed, um, that I can actually envision the way Waterford looked back in 1753 when he came here, um, coming up French Creek and the, the total forest and and how it doesn't look like that at all now, but um, I think it's beautiful here, and I can imagine what it looked like then. I love Waterford, and I don't live here, so that's interesting to me. Um, I live in Girard, Pennsylvania, and I grew up in Leroy, New York, and the three little towns all really are so common. Um, they have so much in common. They all have this Main Street that to me, Main Street just speaks to me. Often I will park my car at one end of Main Street, usually at the post office, and I'll walk down um, to the bank, and then I'll go to lunch at the hotel, and then I'll just walk back to the post office. And I do that several times just because there's just an energy about being on a Main Street. You can almost see what it was like decades ago. Like sometimes I will walk by the Eagle Hotel and I'll think, oh, I wonder what that looked like when Washington was here. Or I wondered what this looked like. Or, um, you know, you'll pay, pass one of the pizza places and you'll think, I wonder what that was like in the 50s on a Friday night when everyone was going to the football game and you have the big old cars out there and, you know, the, the young people on dates and things like that. And um, you just see different things walking down the main streets. Oh, it's, a, it's an easy town. You know, you get to know the people. You do. And, and you become involved with them. And uh, uh, it, it's just a, a nice little small town that still does exist. And with the growing population, the bigger cities trying to expand, uh, I don't know how many more years we'll be able to uh, uh, achieve this, you know. My favorite thing about Waterford is probably the people. Uh, when my youngest daughter was about seven, we were walking down Main Street, and she said, do you know what I like about Waterford? And I said, what's that? And she said, everybody knows your name. That can be good or bad. <laughs> my favorite thing about Waterford are the people. The people are really nice people, friendly people, courteous people, and helpful people. You ask somebody to help you with a project, and most generally, they're more than willing to help. About Waterford is, is the hardworking people that are um, very uh, committed to the area. My favorite thing about Waterford is definitely the community spirit, um, the cooperation between businesses and residents and, and nonprofits. It's just a great place to live and grow up. I would have to say um, the hometown feeling that you get. It's a small community. Everybody knows everybody, and that could be good or bad. Um, but my family has grown up here. Um, we still reside here. Um, it's nice to be part of the community. Um, being with the fire department for as many years as I have been, um, it's a generational thing. And uh, to be a fireman, you really have to understand that you know, there, you're there for the community. You're part of the community that you live in. And whatever happens, good or bad, 
uh, we are there to, to make sure that everybody um, is well taken care of. Um, what I like about Waterford is I love that just about everybody knows everybody. Uh, a lot of people go to the local post office and pick up their mail. It's kind of a meeting place for people. Well, I like the small town because it's, I mean, you know everybody, everybody knows you, and uh, they're friendly regardless of where you go. If you go to Jake's on the Park or to Waterford Days in the summer, you always run into people that you know, and it's nice to have that friendly, smiling face all the time. What I love about Waterford um, are the people, the people, the, the, um, the closeness, the uh, familiarity with each other, you know, where it's not, uh, everybody's living their own lives, their own, you know, just moving on. It's just, we're all, it's all connected. And it's, it's just the, the community, the sense of community. Um, and you see that in, in, again, with the students. The students, the school is, is I guess, it's a, an example of what the community is, you know. Um, so when you go into the school and you see that caring atmosphere, you see, uh, you see someone who has a, you know, maybe who's having a hard time or struggling in school, and then you see some of the uh, some students who don't maybe not know that know that student will help them out, will encourage them. I don't know. It's just it's hard to explain, but it's uh, that sense of caring and that sense of um, community. Well, you know, Jack and I were out just driving around the back roads of Waterford one nice summer afternoon, fairly recently, and we stopped on the top of a hill out east, and it overlooks the community. And I just stood there, and you know, at, at my age, 83, I, I looked at this community and I thought, this is my life. Among all of these maple trees, we're so heavily populated in, in this state. And you could pick out a few buildings down there, and I, I, I really thought to myself, such a tiny speck we are, you know, really in this world. But I'm so glad that this is my life here. This is, this is where I'm from. This is where my heart is. I love that it's home. I grew up here. My friends are here. My family is here. I have maintained friendships with people from elementary school. I've maintained friendships with people for over 50 years. Whenever I'm feeling like maybe I've not accomplished as much with my life as I might have liked to, or maybe I'm on the outs with a family member, I remember that I've managed to have long lasting friendships within this community for the past 50 years. And one of my very treasured possessions is a plaque that I look at every day, a gift from my parents. It says something to the effect of, though the path may roam, this is home. My heart remains here, this is home. And it says Waterford, Pennsylvania on the bottom of it. And I love it. I think a whole lot of other people probably feel the same way I do. Our Town Stories from Waterford is brought to you in part by the Fort LaBeouf American Legion Post Number 285. The American Legion, committed to mentoring youth and sponsorship of wholesome programs in our communities, advocating patriotism and honor, promoting strong national security, and continued devotion to our fellow service members and veterans. The Fort LaBeouf American Legion Post Number 285 success depends entirely on active membership, participation, and volunteerism as the organization belongs to the people it serves and the community in which it thrives. More information is available at the Post located on West 4th Street or by calling 814-796-3910. The Fort LaBeouf Historical Society Founded in 1974, the Fort LaBeouf Historical Society's mission is to preserve the history of the Fort LaBeouf area and educate the public about Waterford's heritage. The campus, located on the site of the original French Fort LaBeouf, consists of the Eagle Hotel, Washington Park, the Amos Judson House, and the Fort LaBeouf Museum. The properties are owned and operated by the Society through memberships, fundraisers, gift shop sales, and the generosity of our donors. More information is available at fortlebeouphistory.com. 
the Waterford Lions Club, with more than 1.4 million members in over 200 countries and areas around the world. Lions Clubs are best known for fighting blindness, but also volunteer for many different kinds of community projects, including caring for the environment, feeding the hungry, and aiding seniors and the disabled. The Lions Club motto is We Serve, and the Waterford Lions are actively doing just that. For more information or to join the Waterford Lions, meetings are held on the second or fourth Tuesday of each month. Waterford Physical Therapy and Sports Rehab, where the patient is the only focus. The 3,000 square foot state-of-the-art facility is staffed with doctors of physical therapy as well as physical therapist assistants to ensure evidence-based treatment for optimal outcomes. They are also direct access certified, open six days a week, and accept most insurances. Appointments are available and scheduled within 24 hours by contacting the office at 814-796-3400. Our Town Stories from Waterford is also brought to you in part by Russell's of Waterford Furniture and Design Studio and viewers like you. Thank you.